All right, guys, how you doing? It's Rubia. Hope you're all good. So hopefully you enjoyed my last video, which was uh, called Just Cause, and it was basically a riff video uh, that I wanted to do because it's been a while since I played on my baritone and made a dirty riff tune. So that was the whole premise behind the song and got a bunch of requests to do a mix breakdown of this track. So I figured I would do that for you. So that's what this video is about. We're going to take a look at my session, uh, break it down and go over a couple of the processes and things I've done in this track to get it to sound the way I did. Uh, again, quick disclaimer, I'm not a professional mixing engineer or anything. I do this for fun. Uh, if any of you guys out there are mixing professionals and you're like looking at what I'm doing going, oh, I'm not sure about that. I apologize in advance, but yeah, I'm going to take you through what I've done and uh, yeah, let's check it out. Okay, this is my main arrangement window of my session. Some of you will recognize this is Logic Pro X. It's my preferred DAW, uh, but you obviously use whatever you want. It's the only one I know how to use. In any case, this is the main arrangement window. We've got 25 tracks in total, including my buses and stuff. Uh, and basically what we're looking at here is everything in the song. So my drums along the top, that's all the uh, MIDI drums. And then we've got the guitars here, we've got bass here. Uh, then you've got a bunch of uh, buses, and then I've got some lead, uh, some layers, uh, synth, uh, and some more riffs, I think, down here somewhere. In any case, that's basically all we've got in this tune, and I'll, I'll show you what, what, what they are as we go. Okay, so first things first, let's take a quick listen, see what we've got going on. That's the kind of main heavy sort of everything at full whack kind of sound. First thing I'll just get out of the way is how I like to mix is doing automation. So if I go into automation mode, uh, most of it is transferred over to buses. So like I've got parallel compression here. I've got my guitar tracks here. This is the delay that you just heard loads of in the, in the solo, some reverb. Uh, that is some synth. And as you can see, I'm just kind of nudging things around a uh, few db sort of tolerance as you, as you probably say depending on what i need from when uh, and yeah that's like how i like to mix it's essentially uh, using these yellow lines are essentially faders on a mixing desk that's how you want to think about them i haven't actually automated any bass but in terms of the drums and the guitars that i like to automate around and of course the lead as you can see there's tons going on automation wise on the lead um i just wanted to get that out of the way first so let's start with drums. So I haven't even labeled my tracks here. I just sort of wrote the tune and just cracked on with it. So um, these are my drums. And I'm also gonna go ahead and uh, solo all the drum tracks. So you've got your parallel here, your main drum bus. Oh no, that's the parallel here, main drum bus here. And then these are all uh, the drum tracks. So let's, let's take a listen. So that's how they sound. Uh, first thing I've noticed is I didn't actually put a gate on that low floor tom, so it goes on for ages. Um, should probably have put a gate on that, but in any case, let's just this is this is what I'm using. So this is the P4 kit from GGD. Uh, Get Good Drums. Nolly does all the engineering for the Get Good Drums stuff. This is Matt Halpin's signature kit from the Periphery, the fourth Periphery album. Uh, I personally really like it. I think it's one of the most vibey. It's got a really nice cymbal collection, um, and generally everything sounds really good. One thing I would point out here is that I was struggling a little bit to get the sort of beef from the drums that I wanted over the top of this riff. So what I actually did was make a bit of a Frankenstein kit with uh, the One Kit Wonders Aggressive Rock. What, the only thing we're actually using is the kick in the snare and a bit of room. Everything else is turned off. I am using the master EQ in parallel. But um, what I'll do, if I can, is just mute it all so you can't hear it. So let me just do that. I'm just going to mute everything and then we'll turn it back on. So check it out. I'm 
and bring it back in. And then with the room. Something else that's cool is that the parallel EQ, uh, parallel compression and EQ that comes with the One Kit Wonders actually really help with the mix if I turn them off. You can clearly hear that it's adding more intensity to the sound. If I take them out, and you hear the track and put them in. So yeah, basically that's what's going on uh, in terms of the drums. If you're curious about how to get a Franken kit going as a call it um there's a great video on ggd about how to do it but essentially when you load up a second kit you just want to make sure that uh, the maps all you want in the mapping section is just what you're after so for me it was just the kick and the snare so that's the only thing mapped to the same kick and snare in p4 but then also you just set your midi channel to omni on that second one there so that it would come up um when whenever this gets hit then that one gets hit too. So that's basically how, how you do it. Uh, but that's that's the drum kit. In terms of processing on the kit, uh, as I said, first things first, I'm sending everything to a parallel compression bus so that you can see bus two is my parallel compression. Um, but other than that, I use um, FabFilter Pro Q3 because it's amazing. Um, and I use GGD. Again, this was like a quick, just churn it out kind of tune. Um, so I'm using quite a few uh, sort of channel strip presets that I've saved over the years that I enjoy. Like on this one here, I use for Totemist is the is the preset I made for the overheads uh, with Soothe on, so it just soothes everything. If you don't know about this plugin, it's fantastic. But let's go through, just have a little listen again to you know some of the stuff that I'm doing for the snare, for example. So. Take it all off. So I'm notching a little bit of ring out of it. Taking away some of that thickness because we don't need it. But once we start compressing with GGD, it's just bringing out more of the under snare. And the, and the tape saturation obviously brings out a really nice character as well. Um, so let me show you what it sounds like without either of these processings on. So that's basically what I'm doing across everything. What you heard there is just I'm carving out of uh, the drum sounds to make everything, give me more headroom on the master bus here, which is something that is really common in heavy modern music. You basically trying to carve out as much from all the instruments so that you can ultimately, you know, smash it on the master bus uh, and add back in the stuff that you may be missing that's that's kind of what that's kind of what i think at least so yeah it's just rinse and repeat so as you heard on the snare i've done it on the kick as well um so carving out some low end um I'm also carving out a lot of presence because I actually find a lot of the GGD samples as are very bright for my tastes so I like to uh, pull a lot of that out so I'll show you what it sounds like without I mean that's really clicky it works for some music but for the way I like my kicks to be it's just a bit too much and I'll show you what it sounds like without <laughs> And, you know, in a way, it almost loses a tiny bit of its definition of the notes, but I actually think it sounds more human f for that. It, it sounds a little bit more inconsistent in a way, which I think is kind of good. 
uh, especially on the kick, you know. I, I never like it to sound too mechanical and clicky. It's just not really my taste. Drum samples, I find I'm battling a lot with, especially toms as well, making them sound like someone really played it rather than it just being a tom sample. So it is, it's quite difficult. It's, it's an ongoing sort of push and pull to, to get the most out of the, most human sound out of the uh, drum sampling world. I would also recommend that if you can play drums and you have an electric kit, it's well worth uh, playing in the grooves. So for like the verse section, uh, I actually, well, the verse section as well as other grooves in the song, I play the grooves in. All the technical stuff I can't do, but all the groovy stuff I enjoy. So it's nice to get more of a human feel. So I'll show you that section now. So yeah, basically, I tidy it up, of course. I put the stepped hi-hat in velocity heavy just so you could it would cut through in the right places. Like for example, the little step before the next bar. It's nice to get that in there. Um, and also just making sure that the hits on the trash were actually, the stack even, were coming out nicely. But I don't really like to overly boost the um, velocities here, especially not the kick. Sometimes I like to get that bloom um, as you can see, I've definitely edited this because you can see the velocities are the same, this little fill at the end. So yeah, basically, um, it's, a, it's a combination of playing the grooves and uh, tighten everything up with MIDI. That's the beauty of using MIDI drums, I guess. So in the verse, I actually bring down the parallel compression and the, uh, the room and stuff. So let me just show you what that sounds like. Um, again, if I go ahead and solo everything so you can see what's actually happening drums wise hopefully you can hear it when it's on its own so we're going to get a drop in the parallel and room now So hopefully you could hear the subtle dynamic changes there. It's also things like when it gets right technical, um, you want to make sure that there's not too much room going on because it sort of clouds up the drums in a way. So check this out. So that's, so that's a prime section, this little bit here with the toms. If I boost the room right up, you'll see what I mean. So I was just messing around with the automation there so you could clearly hear like when the toms and there's a lot more intricate stuff happening on the drums, you don't want it to be really like roomy if you want to hear the detail. So that's what I generally like to do is uh, dynamically just very subtly pull the focus in and out where I need it on the drums. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's the drums. Let's move on to the bass next. I would honestly say that bass is probably my weakest area in terms of uh, getting the, the sound exactly how I like it. Like I really like the bass sounds that I get, but at the same time, they do annoy me that they're not exactly right. And I actually relied a lot on the bass synth to get the real bassy stuff. But let me show you, this is the verse bass. So it's kind of not tons of presence because there's so much in the guitars, check it. It just adds a bit of reinforcement. Again, even on the main riff here. It 
it's subtly in there uh, and it just kind of blends with the overdrive of the guitars but um, I actually relied a lot on the synth as I said to get that really pumping so I'll, I'll add it in It adds a really nice level of control to the bass. So yeah, that, that's the synth supporting that. Let me show you what it sounds like on its own. I find that to be such a useful t uh, technique with heavy music because the bass, especially down in drop A, I do it a lot more. I want that controlled low end and it's so handy having bass synth. Use a bass synth plugin or use you know any sort of synth inside your DAW. I use the Moog, but if you've got a Moog or anything like that, just find a, a really nice, powerful, controlled low end. In terms of what I'm doing to it processing wise, I'm adding clip distortion, some channel EQ to shelf the top end because that'd be too intense. Kind of cool though. Um, and then I'm smashing it so it's even more consistent with uh, an Empirical Labs distressor. And then I'm adding R bass, which is a plugin by Waves, which essentially just gives me an even, it's like a synthetic support sub bass plugin. It's really useful. If I take this synth out and then add it back in, you'll see what I mean. So this is without. And now I'll throw it in. So yeah, hopefully you can hear just how more how much more consistent sub synth, bass synth, whatever, helps with the overall mix. In terms of what's going on with the bass channel, I use a preset that I use for the Totemist that I made that I really like. Pulling out a little bit of a howling frequency, which you've seen in another, in another video I did uh, around, uh, yeah, 211, so... It just makes it a little more, uh, less howling, and it, it jumps out less. Um, and then I'm adding some presence just to cut through around the guitars, just to try and blend it together. Other than that, something that's very important, which I've explained in other videos on mixing and with this, is I sidechain a compressor to the kick drum uh, so that the kick drum pokes through above it. And, and I've done the same on the bass synth, just so it doesn't get lost. So let me show you, you should be able to see the needle. You can, that needle is moving whenever the kick's being hit, so. Again, it's a, it's a no-brainer in heavier music to make the kick cut through and have a bit more of presence in the, in the situation. With the guitars, it's a Quad Cortex preset that I made. It's, um, it's come from the Frog Leap preset that I use, and then I just, it, EQ'd it further and messed with it on the quad cortex and just as I said this was just to track a tune and just get on with it so I loaded a preset just smashed it out whatever in terms of what's happening on the guitar bus shelving the low end obviously with the EQ out it sounds more full range it's almost sweeter to the ear EQ guitars from mixes never sound as nice as they do on their own it's just always the way like if you solo guitars from any mix one of your favorite mixes you'd be like that's so thin and weird sounding but, you know, if you took the EQ off and listened to it in isolation, it sounds much nicer like this. Those chugs, and then if I put the EQ in. As you can see, I've tried to keep some of that information in whenever you're chugging. It's hitting the compressor a bit, uh, which brings me to my next point. I'm using uh, the Fatso, Empirical Labs Fatso, which is a, is a tip I learned off uh, Tom Waterman from Universal Audio whenever we've done stuff with him. He adds it to the guitars. He says it brings out like a nice bit of musical fizz from the guitar, so let me show you.
Obviously, they're boosted in volume quite a lot. So, in fact, let's see if I can ride the volume just to show you what it sounds like without. So. You should be able to hear just when I'm chugging, there's that extra little bit of coming, whatever that was, coming from the sound. And obviously it's compressing, so it's keeping the dynamics up as well. And once again, that's it, that's EQ and compression. It's basically all I'm doing for the most part across everything. Again, this wasn't a really in-depth mix. It's, you know, like I say, it's 25 tracks, including buses, and it's just very straightforward EQ and compression, some panning, some automation, just to try and get the tune out really. That was that was really the point. Other than that, we've got some lead to look at and a couple of layers. So let's start with the lead. Something else I wanted to point out as well. I'm gonna to go to the big screen for this. When we're recording and we're doing this kind of stuff at home, when you guys are writing your own tunes and I'm doing this kind of stuff and all the other people I see on Instagram and stuff, something that's really important to point out that, that I think is, is a really good thing to bear in mind when you were doing this is, you're learning a riff, you're learning a song, you're learning a part on the spot, then you're trying to record it for release quality purposes. And that's a lot, you know, that's really intense to try and get that in there and do it at such a level on the guitar, or on the bass, whatever else you play. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a tall order and it's great, but you know, something you can end up doing is pulling your hair out because you can't get it down, you can't get the take you want. And it's just like, this is driving me crazy, right? One thing that I've learned to live with over the years doing it, especially from home on your own, is comping. When you're in a studio, they'll usually comp you. I mean, it depends on the situation. Like if you're live tracking, it's not possible. If you're tracking to tape, it's definitely not possible. Comping is not something to be worried about or put down by. Like you think, I should be able to play it all in one go. At the end of the day, we're trying to record music and get it sounding really nice and however you think sounds really nice. And if you want the imperfections, great. Some people don't. I don't, especially when I'm playing like lead, I don't always want to hear like string ring and stuff. And sometimes the take was so good apart from that, that I want to comp it out. As I'm getting onto the lead now, you may notice that it says comp B. That's basically because I comp together a bunch of different passes um, to find the nicest sounding ones so that the release version sounded really nice and like together. And like live, it's live, it's different. In the studio, I think comping is so handy and it shouldn't be frowned upon, in my opinion. Um, there's obviously a point where you can take it too far and comp this, the hell out of something and then it's just unrealistic. I have comped some stuff and I've not comped other stuff, as, as you can see. Looking at the bass here, um, just as an example, you can see the bass in the verse just around here. And here. And that'll literally have been because maybe I rushed one of those or it wasn't quite right or I need a note like this one, I want it to end quicker. So I've obviously cut it and pulled it back or whatever, whatever I've done there. And it's the same across the board on the guitars, done it on the solos. Um, you generally tend to find you end up comping a little bit more on solos because there might be certain notes you rung out in a certain way that you really want to involve that in the, the final comp. So you end up being a little bit more in intricate in that sense, really depends on the project. But I just wanted to point out comping, it's really useful. If you guys want me to do a video on how comping works and comping solos and riffs, I will totally do that because I think it's a really useful tool and it saves so much stress when you're trying to record stuff and get it done under time pressure or you just wanna get it out and you don't wanna be pulling your hair out on performance all the time. Anyway, let's move on to lead. Let's take a listen, let's go into the verse here. So let me show you the ambiences I'm using first. Um, there's reverb and delay, and the way I've done it is I've kept the delay out of the reverb signal path because I wanted a bit more definition from the delays, but this is my favorite reverb plugin that Universal Audio do. It's incredible, it's called Capital Chambers. So let me show you how the reverb sounds. It's also worth pointing out that I tracked with a bit of reverb and delay from QC, just because I was in a rush and I just did, but I added more afterwards, but this is how it sounds. <laughs> And again, like if I throw in the delays now. Yeah. 
So as you can hear, it's not doing tons there, but I'm automating it at this point. So check it out. So yeah, that sounds really random, but it, I wanted to, it to sound like the song was spiraling out of control a bit, and that seemed like the best way to do it was to bring up the feedback and make it sound really chromatic and horrible. I think I worked really well for what I was trying to do. And again, it was just like a quick, oh, I wonder if that'd work, throw it on. Yeah, it works. In terms of the delay I'm using, it's literally just Logic's tape delay. Um, threw the free feedback up to 70 and just found the right timing and EQ'd it here how I wanted it. So yeah, it's really basic. And again, Capital Chambers reverb, I EQ'd it afterwards a little bit, pulled out <laughs> quite a bit of low mid for some reason. Uh, but that's what I did there. In terms of the uh, lead, the actual tone of it. Um, I pulled out low end and some mids. It was a bit cloudy, so. Like it's sounding a bit cloudy in the mix, so. So yeah, the EQ is there just to sit it better. Often, often, sometimes I listen to it and I think, oh, actually, I'm not sure. But as you listen through the song, you notice things jump out less. Everything sounds more controlled. So if ever you're not sure about an adjustment you've made, you know, rewind the song and listen through as a song rather than just over that section. Sometimes it's nice to get that perspective. The only other thing that I've added to the lead is one of my favorite plugins uh, for lead, and that is the K-Precision Stereo from UAD. It's a stereo widener, and it's just like the same thing like John Petrucci would have on his lead tone, and I've used in Tosca in the past, but a plugin version. Uh, and then I put it on the lead vocal setting. So let me show you what it sounds like without it. <laughs> You might notice that it's actually adding a bit more thump to the, the very widest part of the stereo image, which is what you want, for me at least. You want to hear the pick attack. If everything's up the center too much, it, I'm not really sure it jumps out in the right way. That's what I was trying to get it to do using the plugin was so you could hear that pick attack just a bit wider. <laughs> places it in such a nice place for me in the mix where I can hear it more, it's detailing more. So that's great. To be honest, that's pretty much all I've done with the lead there. Again, compression EQ and the stereo widener. I've added the reverb delay that I'm automating in more of musical application. And yeah, that's basically it. Now that we've done that, finally, we're on to just the little layers that you might have heard throughout the track. So there's one here, so let's check it out. It's literally my guitar. It's literally uh, an octave sound with loads of reverb and delay, and I'm up picking like that, like that over and over again, and it's creating that kind of hypnotic sound. So that's that. And you can see I've shortened the tail here. It was going on for too long. So that's that. And then in the verse, you can see I've got something called verse filter. That's just there as a bed to add more harmony, more melody to what's actually happening in the verse. So let me take out the lead. Um,
so yeah, it's 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 such a small thing, but it really does help add to the overall arrangement. There is another cool layer that comes out of the second solo. <laughs> Quite a cool riff. It's really quiet in the background there. I start bringing it up in volume to lead into the next note, the key change, this note now. Now. Again, it's a subtle thing, but in the mix, you'll notice that you'll, you'll subtly hear that note suggesting where the song's going next. It was, it was highlighting that, that A. This is something I like to do, is subtly blend in like the sound of the next root, I suppose. Other than that, over this ending, this like dirty bit we've got. Uh, let me play it without actually. So we got. So that's that, but I, had, I wanted to add a cool brew, like brewing sound. So that's what's happening here. It's my synth, my Moog. with a bunch of reverb on it, but in the mix, it sounds so cool. So yeah, that that's the purpose of that is, again, to build the tension right before the release just a simple thing. In case you're wondering what this MIDI information is here, that is the, the Moog synth. What I've done, what I do is I hook it up uh, to the computer so I can record in the MIDI information that I've played. And then if I mess it up, I can tweak the information. And then I spit the MIDI out of the computer back to the Moog uh, and, re and record in the audio. But everything you're seeing here correlates with everything you're seeing underneath. It's, it's all the MIDI information. And the cool thing with that is that I could then use that in another MIDI instrument if I wanted the same notes and stuff. Or if I wanted to change the sound of the MIDI, uh, sorry, of the synth, I could delete this, you know, this take and then retune the sound and then re-record it with the right sound and it would be the same performance. So it's, it's really cool, really, really handy. So anyway, that is the a kind of a mixed breakdown on Just Cause, which is the most recent tune that I've done because you guys asked me to sort of break it down. Hopefully it was insightful. Hopefully you learned something, hopefully. In any case, yeah, I really enjoy mixing. It's one of my favorite things to do. And I always feel like I'm learning and getting better at it. And it's always a new challenge depending on the song or the style of music you're trying to mix. With this, it's definitely heavier than the stuff I normally do. So it was like, I guess, difficult to not over compress things, even though it is very heavily compressed. You don't want everything to squish and everything's so aggressive sounding. You want everything to jump through and fight. and. You, you, sorry, you don't want everything to fight. You want it to jump through in the right parts of the mix and all the rest of it. So it's quite difficult. You make a few compromises and also I was trying to rush it out. So there's all that to consider. I've given you all the caveats under the sun. In any case, that is my mix breakdown of Just Cause. I hope you enjoyed it. If you've got any questions about it, if I didn't cover anything and you want me to shed more light on it, put it in the comments section below. And if you wanted me to do a video on comping and how that works and how we go about it, let me know and I'll do that as well. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you haven't heard the track yet, I'll link it in the description box. But that's it. Hope you enjoyed this video. Like, subscribe and share. I've been Rabir and we'll see you all very soon.